if we love the Lord, we want to look like the Lord. We want to be with the Lord. We want to imitate him. We want to obey him. And the word holiness sounds like a dirty word, sounds like a heavy word, a power play, a religious word. But I think uh, in the end, it's about being like him so we can be closer to him. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. The Canadian Church Leaders Network is all about seeding a hopeful future for the church in Canada by coming alongside pastors to serve, connect, and resource them as they go out and do the same for their communities. That's the vision. So if you're looking to be further resourced, connect with more church leaders across the country, or hear incredible stories of God's faithfulness in the church in Canada, follow us on Instagram by searching CCLN, visit ccln.ca, or subscribe to our channel below. Thanks again for watching this video. Have a good one. Well, Simon, it is pretty special to be with you. For those that don't know you, give us a little window into your life and ministry. Sure. Well, thanks, uh, Jason. And it was a pleasure to meet you. Privileged to hang out with your uh, team last week. And thanks for inviting me on to the podcast. Um, I'm Simon, married to Tiffany. Uh, we've been married 33 years. We've got two grown up lads. And uh, I'm currently a minister. I say currently, I've been a minister for 23 years mm. in Oxford. For seven of those, I was a university chaplain. I was the official evangelical chaplain and uh, had seven fantastic years um, from 98 to 2005 running a, a ministry for the students. And then for the last 16 years, I've been associate pastor and uh, teaching pastor based at St. Aldate's mm. and uh, encouraged to run the teaching programs, theological programs, and um, release to travel and teach as and when. Mm. You're such a gift, man. And I'd love you just to give us a window into St. Aldate's because just this church itself is like a portal into a story that spans hundreds of years. And so tell us about St. Aldate's, that church that you're part of. Yeah, well, I feel really, really privileged to be there. And um, there's been a wonderful heritage, wonderful history with God uh, doing some wonderful things there. Um, we took up the floor about 20 years ago and um, to put in some new heating, underfloor heating, and we found archaeological evidence um, of a Saxon church hmm. with all the people buried around it and... Uh, we carbon dated the, the bodies to about 950. So they're in wow. our main, our main uh, worship center in the center of the there's a Saxon church. And then there was a Norman church. And then there was a medieval church. And so our church is built um, probably 18th century, but on the foundations of these other worshiping communities that have probably been there for upwards of 1100 years. And wow. uh, that feels really awesome. You know, we we had to reinter and, and have a service of blessing for all the bodies that were buried underneath us. But we we kind of feel that we, we're drawing on on you know their faith, their prayers, their tears, their faithful witness over the centuries. And um, Saint Aldate's has been a, 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 a well, I suppose, a leading evangelical church for about a hundred and fifty years. Um, you may have heard of the Keswick movement. Have you heard of Keswick? No, tell me about it. It's, a, it, it's been going for over 100 years in, uh, in, in north of England, but it was one of the sparks for um, the Korean revival and Welsh revival and things like that. But the very hmm. first meeting was hosted by the Vicar of St. Aldate's. And uh, the next year they said, let's meet in Keswick. And... Um, and we've had some remarkable leaders there, uh, evangelists. Michael Green, who was a, yeah. a very well-known evangelist. He was the vicar, the senior pastor for many years. Then after him, uh, he once told me that the Alpha Course began in his front room in mm. St. Aldate's Vicarage. And uh, over the years, we've had some extraordinary vicars uh, uh, right up to the present day. Stephen Foster, who formerly was the international director of Alpha. and it's a it's a wonderful church. I'm so blessed to be there. You know, I have to pinch myself. But uh, mm. 
uh, it's a evangelical, it's a charismatic, it's word and spirit. Um, we, you know, mission focused and we love the poor. Mm. And we just want to be a place that rolls out the red carpet for Jesus and rolls out the red carpet for those who've not come to church. Mm. It was really impactful for me to be there and think about a thousand years of history because in the Canadian context, we're young. The church, churches we go to, the buildings are young. The denominations are young. And I just wonder, Simon, for you, what it does for your sense of faith, but even vocation, like being part of a heritage of faith and Christian ministers that goes back generations. How does that form yeah. the way in which you carry the calling even today? Yeah, that's a good question uh, that I've not thought about. Um, I was in a context uh, a while ago uh, where the, the leader of the, the network was saying, we don't want to hear from preachers any stories that aren't that are more than a year old mm -hmm. and i completely understood why they wanted uh, illustrations that were fresh and of fresh experiences and that you know if you can say yesterday god said to me there's an immediate kind of oh interesting but uh i think being part of a church that's a thousand years old literally on the site um and part of a, a, a denomination if you like that's 500 years old and there's a sense of, um, of being part of that, that uh, great cloud of witnesses that it becomes very close and real and um, a sense of history and uh, a, a wanting to honor that and a sense of, you know, the long, long run of obedience in the same direction and faithfulness to that and, and uh, having received a, a baton and wanting to, to pass that on. Um, and being part of that continuum. Mm. I, I mean, it's not just a sort of jump from here now, church life, back to the New Testament. It, it, it sort of underlines God's faithfulness through the years and, you know, in season and out, that the gospel's gone out. And uh, mm. yeah, so it, 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 I, I feel part of that. I've, it connects me not just to the, the, the God story of scripture, but the God story of him building his church in the gates of hell, not prevailing against it. I remember as we were walking through Oxford, you were, you gave us an impromptu tour of sorts and you're a great tour guide. <laughs> you should, you should host tours. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you're going to get Canadians now reaching out saying, I'm coming to Oxford. Can you show me? <laughs> and we stopped and I thought it was pe peculiar at the time. We stopped in the middle of the road and I thought, well, this is not a great place to stop but you pointed to a spot on the ground and uh, you spoke about martyrs about 500 years ago that burned at the stake there. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Because that was a profound moment for me as oh, we were standing well, there. Bless you. I, I, uh, I mean, these things really impact me. And uh, so I share them with those who come, but yeah. So I, I'm part of the church of England. I'm an ordained minister in the church of England. And um the Church of England had a, an interesting and untidy kind of beginning. Or, but um, in 1555, the church having come through um, uh, the Protestant Reformation and wanting to incorporate some of those reforms in the church, there was a pushback. And um, Archbishop Cranmer, who wrote the Book of Common Prayer, and then a couple of bishops, Bishop Ridley and Bishop Latimer were, um, were tried for um, well, treason and, uh, and they were burnt at the stake at that point where the place where we, we visited. And so, yeah, 470 years ago, um, the founders, the architects, I mean, Cranmer wrote the Book of Common Prayer that has been the liturgical and underpinning that, the theological foundation for the the Church of England, Church in England, and um, he was burnt there because he loved the Lord and he was faithful mm. to his word and he was saying yes to what he believed God was saying, bringing the church back to the Bible and removing all those accretions that had built up. And um, Latimer said to Ridley, you know, Ridley was, uh, was, was, uh, was anxious, uh, understandably, as he was about to go to the stake, and uh, Latimer says, 
profound, you know, he said, play the man, Master Ridley, for this day we shall light such a fire that will never go out. And uh, that moves me, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, I feel, I feel these are, these are the fathers of our faith, um, not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and not just our, uh, you know, the apostles and the prophet, but I, I feel that these men of God who laid down their life for the gospel, for the church in England, and, um, you know, shed their blood, you know, 200 yards from our church. Um, so I feel we, we, we honor that, we respect that, and uh, we want to walk in the same spirit of faithfulness to God. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. When we were in St. Aldate's, I think it was Stephen Foster, the rector of the church. Um, I knew him through Alpha days and he was sharing, he goes, he pointed the back door and he goes, he goes, you know, however many years ago, George Whitfield's filled with the Holy Spirit walked through that door. And he goes, in this room, he goes, J.I. Packer got saved in the evening college student service or whichever yeah. it was. And then yeah. just 30 you know, yards or meters that way, you know, John Wesley and the Holy Club was meeting there. And those stories, yeah. like that just really, I mean, those are names that those, I'm part of those stories. They've impacted me. Packer was a professor at Regent College, oh. which is 15 minutes from where I'm recording right now. And uh, just to think that he was a college kid or however old he was, came to the evening service. I host an evening service. I was like, yeah. who could walk in the door to the evening service and meet Jesus? It's just amazing stories. Yeah, well, again, uh, we, uh, I feel that. And we tell those stories because they're treasures and we want to treasure them. But uh, yeah, J.I. Packer uh, came up to university from Gloucester and uh, about 60 miles up the road. And um, I think it was 47. 1947, but uh, in, in second or third week, he came to the evening service and um, we ha they had a service called the, it was 8.15, because it had to be after college chapel and then college supper. So they put it on 8.15. And it was interesting, about 20 years ago, maybe a bit less, we started a new service called 8.15. And at that time, we hadn't read in, in Packard saying he got converted at all dates at 8.15. So we were like, whoa, 8.15. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, he came and, and the gospel was preached and he came, came to faith there. Um, and George Whitfield came to faith and there's one account in, uh, of him running into St. All Dates to worship. Um, and uh, he, he's, he was at the college that's about 15 feet away from our front door and um, Pembroke College. Across the way, John and Charles Wesley were at Christ Church College. And then he became just up the road, a chaplain at Lincoln. And so, yeah, the evangelical awakening in England that then fired and fueled the Edwards and the Great Awakening in North America, um, founded the Methodist movement. The Methodist movement becomes the holiness that influences Azusa and Pentecostalism. You know, some of these sparks just took off in Oxford, and mm. um, we're waiting for him to do some more of that in our yeah. day, in our generation, in our church. We want more Packers to get saved and more Whitfields to run in and worship God. Mm. And uh, it doesn't have to be in our church, but we, we want it to happen in our town and in our time. When I was in the UK on this last trip and thinking about the Wesleyan renewal, yeah. the revival, and the state of the church at the beginning, just how bleak it was, it just gave me a lot of hope what God can do in a generation. Yeah. You know, what God can do through people and uh, or through a move of his spirit as he empowers people. And also, as I think about church history, there is this sense by like, at some point, Christianity peaked and it's just been on decline ever since. But that's not actually the story. The story is waves of renewal. And this happens within generations. What the stories we're talking about aren't ancient. You know, we can follow the thread. And I found in my heart as well, Simon, when I was with you and the team there, just praying, God, would you do something like that in Canada? Amen. You know, like just, and, and just a longing to be part of a, a move of the spirit. It's not a move of man's power. Yeah. Um, that would give him a ton of glory. And it's possible, you know, like he's done it before. Do it again. Yeah. Amen. Well, I hear you and, I, and I'm with you on that 100%. And um, 
you know, I've been at St. Aldate's 23 years and uh, I've been offered other jobs. I've gone for some other jobs and I'm still there. But some people say to me, you've been there a long time. Why are you still there? I said, I'm just waiting for revival. Because hmm. I kind of feel it could happen here. But, um, and I, I, I long for that to happen. And I, I don't just want to read books about revival. I want to be in one. Yeah. And uh, I've got faith for it. And what history shows us is that revival happens when the church needs reviving. It doesn't happen when the church is in a period of great advance. Often it's when the church is on her back foot. And so we, we see this in the, um, you know, we see it in the early 18th century revival in the church of, in England. We see it in the, uh, ninth, in the 1850s revival. We see it in lower stuff. We see it in um, the Welsh revival. And, and it's often when the church is on the back foot. We see it in the great Chinese revival that happened after all the missionaries were kicked out. We see it that the revival that happened in Cambodia after all the Christians were kicked out and, and those who remained, most of whom, 90% of them were killed and uh, Pol Pot. And, uh, and often it's when the church is on a back foot that then God, you know, that she's desperate and is uh, calling out to God and God shows up. I, I, I'd, I'd love it if he showed up before then, but it often seems that it's when, when we're in decline, when the pressure's on, when it seems that the world, the flesh and the devil have taken a lot of ground that then God rends the heaven and comes down hmm. and the earth quakes at his presence. And um, I'm longing for that. And um, one of the things I, I, I've observed reading the histories of revival is that almost always they are led by young people. They're led by people in their late teens and twenties and early thirties. So when the uh, Evangelical Awakening happens in England, the Wes Wesleys and Whitfield are in their, thir they're in their 20s. Jonathan Edwards is 30 when the revival breaks out. Evan Roberts in the Welsh revival is early 20s. Mm. Um, and this can just be iterated out. You just see it time and time again. But often there's, a, there's an older guy with a white beard hanging around <laughs> and just adding a little bit of fuel for the fire. Uh, so I'm excited and um, increasingly I'm looking and praying that God will uh, raise up that young generation of leaders um, and invariably young men and women who catch fire mm. and then go and set their culture, their community, their countries on fire. But I'm believing for it. God doesn't change. It's part of his modus in the past. And so I'm looking for it now. I love it. Simon, I'd love to hear more about your story. I know that you were a butcher. How did you make the move from butcher to vicar? Hey, well, I was a butcher and I absolutely loved it. Uh, when I left school, uh, I did a couple of things, but I ended up in the meat trade and I qualified as a master butcher quite young. So that meant I was earning good money and, um, I was a butcher. We worked. We were. I had a. We had a butcher shop and uh, slaughterhouse and farms and uh, it was a one in the country. Wonderful way of life. But uh, I was always restless in that time. And even though I actually liked the job, I moved from being a butcher to being a buyer. I used to supply about a hundred butchers their their meat. I'd buy it from abattoirs, import, and that. but meat trade was what I did. And of course, in the Old Testament, the Levites were all butchers. So. I think there was a sort of spiritual thing right at the start. But uh, I'm not a Christian. I'd grown up in a Christian family, but I was uh, about as far from God as you can be. But I had a praying father and uh, he just didn't let up with heaven. Uh, I just think he was praying for me all the time. And um, through some very dark and difficult days, uh, in the, the Lord kept sort of breaking in I kept meeting Christians and, but in the end not the beginning if you like I was in a car I was a young adult and I was having a row with a friend of mine and uh, he, he had a go at me and I either smacked him in the gob or I got out the car he was driving so I said stop the car I got out and I was stood outside a, a, ch a church Anglican church 
and my I'd grown up in a, a very strict nonconformist church that said um, you know Rome was the Antichrist and the Church of England her illegitimate spawn but uh, so I'd never never go near never go near church let alone a Church of England church but uh, I heard music heard singing and um, I was a I was a big lad, a big, tough, long hair, you know, went into church and I couldn't believe it. Uh, I couldn't believe it. First, it was full of people and I didn't know church could get full. I thought it had to be like six, six old people and, you know, and, and my dad, the remnant. So it was full. And then I saw that it was full of young people. That blew my mind. Why aren't they, you know, out getting lashed or, and laid as I thought was the thing. And uh, the third thing was the sense of God. Hmm. I just, I just knew it was God. And uh, you name it, I tried it. And I think in all of it, I was trying to find God. I was running from Him, but I was trying to find Him. And here He was in Holy Trinity Nailsy, in an hmm. Anglican church, and. Uh, Anyway, I, they were worship, They were singing. I'd never seen or heard anything like it. And then suddenly they all start singing in tongues. Hmm. Well, honestly, I, I'd smoked a lot of crazy stuff, but this was mine. This was mine. <laughs> and I left. I, I began to shake and cry. And I, I, was, a, I was a a hard guy. And it, you know, I, I just had to get out. But all week it stayed with me, this melody and this harmony and the beauty of it all, the singing. In my... And I remembered from childhood that somehow a verse, though they speak in the voice of men and angels, but have not love, you know? And I thought, this is angels, <laughs> angels in not the room. And I, I hadn't asked my dad a religious question in a decade or more, but I said, uh, I went and saw him and I said, where in the Bible does it talk about angels, voice of angels? He said, why? I said, I want to know. That's why. Anyway, he told me. And I'm, I'm, I found it. I'm reading. Anyway, this went on all week. I'm thinking and I'm being drawn and I'm moved and I'm troubled. And in the afternoon, I was hanging out with, the, with my lads, the lads. And I said, they said, you come to the pub tonight. I said, I'm going to church. They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, no, I'm going to church. And uh, I put on my, you know, I washed, I think I washed my long hair and put on my best cowboy boots and best denim jacket. And I went to get saved. I just knew I was going to meet wow. God. Come on. Anyway, so I did. I went. The preacher preached, talked about the cross of Christ, the love of God, him dying for our sins, forgiveness being freely available, you know, the full wallop. And, uh, I just went to the front. Hmm. I just stood there. And uh, a couple of old guys came and prayed for me. And through the snot and the tears, I, uh, I came to Christ and gave my life to him. And that just turned my life around. Well, I'm a butcher. A few months later, we had a visit. I, I then I'm all in. I'm at church at everything. And a few months later, we had a visiting kind of preacher. And he called out a word, like a word, like a word of knowledge I know now. But then I thought, what is that? Someone, there's, a, there's someone here with a problem with X, Y, Z. And it was me. I had this problem. And I went and got prayed. And he put his hand on me and prayed. And I fell over. I mean, I'd never seen this. So I didn't, I couldn't fake it. Yeah. I hit the deck. And I thought, and then just wave after wave of God's love, grace. Wow. I just felt getting washed clean and I stood up after about 10 minutes I, I said oh thanks man <laughs> or whatever you do all wobbly he said uh, God hadn't finished yet and I fell over again bam and then I felt like just fire go through me electricity coursing power and he started prophesying. Again, I'd never heard it. I didn't know the, what that was. But he started prophesying. He said, you're going to be a preacher. Hmm. And um, God's going to use you to tell us about him. So I, I, that was in 86. And I often say, I went down a butcher and got up a preacher. And 
almost immediately, you just couldn't shut me up. I just had to, I'm just telling everyone I'm consuming scripture. I'm having to preach. I used to take days off of work and literally um, go in my, uh, literally put it on a, like a little bookcase I had and pretend I was preaching to people. I, I was always writing sermons with no one to talk to. Hmm. And uh, anyway, through a, a, a whole set of further things, I left the meat trade. And then I got another job. I left, the, I left work and I just went to live by faith and um, preaching on the streets. Wow. So I was a street preacher and for a year. And in that time, people, other church people would come by and say, do you want to come and talk at my church? Or I'd get invites to preach at a prison or this sort of thing. And then I was asked to plant a church. And I started a church in a pub. And then when there was no room at the inn, we moved into a school. And, and then around that time, I got married. And, and then the church wrote me in and said, we need to make you official and sent me off to seminary. So, wow. That that way. It's beautiful, man. I'm so <laughs> thankful. I'm so that thankful. That was a very that concertina thing. I don't know if that was just a ramble. I love it. I just, I'm just so thankful that God grabbed a hold of your life. I mean, I am. I'm more thankful. Gosh, it's just beautiful to hear. Um, it's beautiful, yeah. and um, I, I was curious if, like, academics and study was part of your life pre meeting Jesus, because you're a really accomplished writer. Like, your books have impacted a lot of people. Um, you've covered a lot of ground, and some of them are, are very comprehensive theologically nuanced works that take broad, big themes and scriptures and make them accessible to people. And so I'm just curious about even that journey, you know? Yeah, well, thank you for, for, for saying that about them. Um, I, uh, I dropped out of school at, at, at 16 and um, I had what we call O levels, but like for, I just, Four, I, I passed four, which meant I failed five hmm. at the age of 16, at the, the sort of halfway through high school. You know? <laughs> and I didn't do well, you know, I only scraped four out of the nine. And, and uh, these, are, these were just, I, I, I don't know the equivalent, but you, you study nine subjects, you know, yeah. and I passed four of them. And so I was a real failure of that stuff. I just wasn't interested. I just was interested in play and, sport and and girls really and um but when i became a christian i just feel my mind i just was hungry to understand god mm. i i just wanted to know him and uh every week when i was a butcher i used to get paid weekly and uh with my money each week i'd go and buy a commentary and I'd read it for my quiet times at half two in the morning, you know, because I start work sometimes five o'clock, four, five o'clock. I'd be up early just reading commentaries, reading them, get paid on a Thursday night, go and buy another commentary. Stuff. <laughs> and just, you know, whoa, it just felt my mind was expanding. And, um, and then when you're teaching, you know, I, I didn't just want to repeat the same old stuff. So I wanted to have some ammo in my, in some content. So I, I, I just found I started reading hmm. and I wanted to know about the Lord, everything about him. And then I wanted to know about his world. And the, so reading a lot. Now, when it came to going to seminary, they said, um, you know, normally to go, you, you go and study a degree, but to study a degree, you've got to have a high school qualifications we call them a levels you've got to have a levels and before that you've got to have nine o levels and i i, I was just but uh they let me in because i'd planted a church already so they kind of and i taught at the seminary on church planting so they kind of let me have a go <laughs> in fact it was the seminary that jim packer was a professor at in england mm. before he went to canada but um not that he was there then and um I just loved it. Hmm. I loved learning. I felt what a privilege. What a privilege that I'm getting, uh, you know, as it were, funded to study about God. I mean, what a thing. And uh, I, I gave it my best shot. I didn't know how I was doing, but at the end of the 
sort of uh, first set of exams, I was sort of doing well. Mm -hmm. And um, then at the end of the next year's exams, I was like coming out, you know, really well. And I was being encouraged to go on and do a doctorate and stuff like that. And um, so I got a, got a, my, the degree and then instead of getting ordained straight away, they said, you need to get ordained. You need another, we want you to do academics. And it was so funny because I thought, you know, if you, I've got some good degrees and I've got four, G, four O levels. Um, and I just say four before Christ and degrees after Christ. And <laughs> there's nothing in between, you know, there's not the usual steps. I think it is a grace, a sign of mm. grace. Mm. But uh, all the while, so I love the study. I love theology. I love, I love thinking about God, teaching about God, helping, uh, introducing others to him. And the books were really a kind of byproduct hmm. of teaching. Uh, and the teaching was joined with my learning of, about the Lord. Um, so I never, I never set out to write books. I was asked a few times when I was a university chaplain by publishers. I said, I don't want to write a book of the making of many books. There is no end and so on. But in the end, the Lord... Um, the Lord kind of led me to write this little book called More. Hmm. And then um, I was, then that opened up all sorts of opportunities. And then I just felt this sort of de desire and encouragement. And so I tried writing a book every year or two after hmm. that. And each year I'd set myself a theme. And I'd just give a year, I'd give like a year to the theme and then try and write a book on it. Hmm. I'd love to chat about a few of them. Um, there's one that you've, you've written called Amazed, and it's about this question, am I still amazed by Jesus? Yeah. Like, is, is there still awe and wonder? Yeah. And I, I think I really like that question. It's a convicting question. I think it's a, a good pastor's question. Yeah. Um, we get up and try to, I think it's fair to say, awe, like give people awe and wonder, like proclaim Jesus, and then yeah. we go home and we, I ask myself the question, do yeah. I have that awe and wonder? Can you tell me a bit about that piece and, and, and not sure. just the book, but what that means to you because it came out of a, a personal yeah. place for you? Yeah, it really did. I had, um, you know, I'd been on the road for quite a while um, doing hundreds of conferences and I was really burnt out on it. And, um, uh, this was pre-COVID, a year before COVID, so probably three years ago, I was just feeling burnt out and weary and, and spent. And um, I felt I'd got to a stage somehow where I was just being a professional Christian. And I was doing it because I was asked to do it. I was meant to do it. I couldn't do anything else. But the, the, the flame, the fire, the passion um, had gone. And... Uh, you know, I think in ministry, we can all go through seasons like that, but that's where I was at. And um, I went to Michael Green's funeral. You said you, you, you knew of Michael or knew Michael. He was a great leader in mission and in renewal. He was a tutor at Regent for years. He was our, our vicar and he'd been a mentor of mine. And I went to his funeral and I think he was 91, I think. He'd written about 70 books. He was a man on fire. And, I, mm. and I'm at this funeral thinking about this man and uh, hearing the testimonies. And I thought, this man was ablaze till the end. I mean, he was all fire, you know. And um, I thought, here am I, middle-aged, and I'm, I'm, I'm just not. Something's mm. gone wrong. And... Um, that was like on the, that was say on the Wednesday, on the Thursday, I'm working on a sermon for Sunday and I've got a text and I'm reading through the gospel passage and it just said, and you know, they were amazed at Jesus. And I, I sat there and I'm in the coffee shop and, and I thought, am I amazed at Jesus? And uh, I thought, I'm not, I, I have been, I was, but somehow I, the, the flame is, is flickering yeah. and um, 
I don't know whether I was praying or just, you know, just, but I just, I was just aware of the presence of the Lord. And uh, I wrote a, I just began writing a list of all the things I should be amazed by. I think I wrote a couple hundred of them, you know, his power, his love, his faith, all his predicates, all his actions. And it just, it just sort of meditating on the truth and reality of that. It just, it just caused something to come alive again. So uh, I preached that on the Sunday and then I started preaching a bit more around Jesus. I, I, let's get back to Jesus. Because <laughs> sometimes we can travel a long way from the gospels. We can be, and all scriptures inspired and God breathed. And, uh, but sometimes we can be so bogged down in the nitty gritty of, you know, an epistle and and uh, or church life, church politics, whatever it is, that we can lose the main in the plane. And Jesus is no longer center stage. He's not front and center. He and uh, he just, I just, he just pushed himself back front and center. Hmm. And so that book was really, it was really uh, uh, me. It was a devotional thing for me to rekindle my first love. Hmm. Um, I, some of the material, much of the material I'd used, but I was reworking it. And the week leading up to the week of the week of Easter, Easter week, I went away for a week and I sat and I got up very early every morning and I wrote that book that week, early in the morning hmm. at like five in the morning of Easter week. And, um, you know, finished Easter day. Hmm. So, and I, I just felt I was, I was wanting to journey through Easter with the Lord. And uh, yeah. anyway, that's why I wrote it. Um, Beautiful. Too often lose our amazement with him. Yeah. Ministers, we, we lose it. Mm -hmm. Ministry can knock the Lord out of our lives somehow. It's a tragic part of it for me. It's tragic. Cause... And the end, the world, the flesh, and the devil conspire to do it. And uh, you know, if 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 the world, the flesh, and the devil can have us ministering without the Lord, that's what they want. Then we got nothing to minister but ourselves, and then that leads to burnout or blowout. We need the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we started recording, you and I chatted a bit about the themes of the fear of God and holiness, and. Um, <laughs> In a generation before me, those were popular themes. In my generation, much less so. And uh, I wonder if you would just take us into those themes a little bit. Yeah, I, well, I, I wrote a couple of books on, on holiness. Um, I, uh, it was at a season in my own life, maybe 15 years ago, I was well, I'd been thinking a lot about renewal and revival and pushing into that and more of the spirit. And uh, essentially that the Lord did a kind of flip on me and said, um, you want more of me and I want more of you. And if you want more of me, it's not just have more of my power, it's to have more of my character. Wow. And, uh, you know, you're pushing after the gifts, but I, I'd like you to have the character. And uh, so I began thinking and, and working on that um, and teaching around that on, on holiness. And, and uh, in particular, the, the, the verse that's repeated, I think half a dozen times, be holy as I am holy. And I thought, gosh, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's so hardcore. You know? <laughs> and is it even possible? But, you know, you say it, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, the Lord says. So I thought, well, what does that look like? And how do, how do I get there? And um, so I worked hard on it. Of course, any study on, on, on holiness, it just sh exposes one's own weakness yeah. and sinfulness and fracture and failure. So it was, it was a tough time. But, um, and uh, <laughs> I can only say I, I feel less holy than when I started thinking about holiness. I just, it just showed up what I'm not, which kind of magnified God's goodness in his faithfulness. But 
that became a really important thing for me. Uh, and uh, I think it, the church has lost it. Um, it. If we love the Lord, we want to look like the Lord. We want to be with mm. the Lord. We want to imitate him. We want to obey him. And the word holiness sounds like a dirty word. It sounds like a heavy word, a power play, a religious word. But I think uh, in the end, it's about being like him so we can be closer to him. Hmm. And um, it's grace all the way anyway. <laughs> you know, he, he enables us. So, yeah. And then fear of the Lord came along again. I was reflecting on the spirit on Jesus and um, the messianic prophecy, you know, the spirit of wisdom and understanding counsel and my knowledge in the fear of the Lord. And his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. And I thought, how can it be that the fear of the Lord is associated with the anointing of the spirit? Hmm. Now, in one sense, it, it's kind of obvious because if the anointing of the spirit is present, that spirit will reveal more of the Lord to us and we will be in awe. So it, it, in one sense, it was obvious, but the fear of the Lord became a renewed theme. And um, I got a friend, a Canadian friend called Guy Chevreau. And it, uh, he told me once he was preaching to a thousand pastors. And he said, um, how many of you, he said, stand up or put your hands up if you minister from the fear of man. And he said, 900 of the thousand put their hands up and stood up. Yeah, my hands 900. Up. And I thought, yeah, I would probably be one of those. Um, but it's the fear of the Lord that replaces the fear of man. And I think I've had the fear of man for a long time on and off and um, competitiveness. And, and in the end, the fear of the Lord, you know, the fear of the Lord is the delight in the Lord. And um, yeah, and it's not being afraid of the Lord. It's enjoying him. It's appreciating him. It's uh, just being in awe of his goodness and his love. And I'd like more of that in my life. And I think it's a key for revival. Whether or not the fear of the Lord comes through revival or whether the fear of the Lord leads to revival, I'm still thinking about it. Mm. But meanwhile, I, I got to pursue the fear of the Lord. And uh, I think many of us, yeah, many of us live with the fear of man. Mm -hmm. Did we do our ministry from what others think, not what God thinks? It says of the, the Levites in the Old Testament that they, they're, mini, they, they, they're set before the Lord, they stand before the Lord. And um, says that of Elijah too, you know, stands before the Lord. And, and therefore standing before the Lord, he's able to minister without fear because it's the Lord. It's just, uh, and I think so often we, we're not standing before the Lord, we're not fearing the Lord, we're, and therefore we're not hearing from him, we're not ministering from him, we're, we're just led by those that we're ministering to or by our own ego or our own fracture or by you know, what we're seeing others doing, but we need to come from that place, the fear of the Lord, being in the presence of the Lord. We need more of that in the church. Yeah. We need more of the Lord in the church, I think. Amen. <laughs> I've set the Lord always before me, the psalmist says, you know, but I think we've got all sorts of other things set before us, five-year plans, deadlines, emails, video the screams the sermon prep i've set the lord always before me one in him is to honor him easy for him to get pushed aside yeah one of the things like i love this format of podcast because you're in england i'm here in vancouver and listeners across canada it's, it's a real gift of technology but one of the things that makes me a bit sad is if we were all together, if you and I were side by side and whoever's listening was all around us in the room, I would probably at this point say, well, should we pray? Should we wait on the spirit and pray? And I don't know what that looks like best in this format, but I wonder if before we just wrap up the conversation, Simon, if you would pray for me and my friends who are listening, pastors in it for a long time, some 
in a short time and scatter all across Canada if you'd pray for us um, into some of the things we talked about and and whatever is on your heart. I just want to receive that. Well, Lord, we bless you. We bless you, Lord. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and you brought us home. And we thank you, Lord, that in your death we have life. We thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your only son that we who believe in you wouldn't perish but have eternal life. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord, that you condescend to dwell in us. And we bless you, Lord, that you call us to serve you. What a privilege, Lord. As David says, who am I and what is my family that you have brought me this far? So we bless you, Lord. And Lord, we want, to, we want to be the best we can be for you. We want to be the best men and women. We want yeah. to be the best husbands and wives, the best parents. We want to be the best friends. We want to be the best we can be for you. We don't want to squander your death for us. We don't want to squander, Lord, your spirit shed abroad in us. We want to be the best we can be. And we thank you that you pour out your love on us and you give us your spirit to transform us and you give us your word to direct us and you give us your sacraments to nourish us and you give us your church for us to belong in a community. And we bless you, Lord. We pray you help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. Yeah. Thank you that even when we're not, you're faithful. You can't deny yourself, but help us to be faithful to you. Lord, I pray for those who, pastors who are listening, who are just all beaten up and that they're hurting on the inside because it's a mess on the outside. Or maybe it just looks really good on the outside. They're still hurting on the inside. Lord, I bless them. I pray that you would restore them pray you'd encourage them. I pray for your balm to heal them and soothe their wounds, Lord. I pray that you'd renew their affections for you and renew their sense of your affection for them. I pray for those, Lord, who've got decisions to make that you would speak clearly, Lord, and quickly so they'd know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to go. I pray, Lord, for those who are listening. I pray for their church community. I pray for their families, that you'll bless them and yeah. encourage them. I pray for their health. I pray for their rest. I pray for, for their minds. But I pray for their time with you. Help them be, to set aside time for a lover's tryst with you. I pray your word would come alive to them. I pray your spirit would overwhelm them. I pray that just be rekindled in their love for you, Lord, and their love for yours and their love for the lost. I pray for those who are just struggling, knowing what to do. I pray you download to them, Lord, vision. Mm -hmm. Your word says that you give young men visions. Give the young men visions, Lord. I'm an old man. I could do with a dream, but give visions to the young men and the young women. We pray they'll just hear from you and declare your word. We yeah. pray that in their communities, there would be a hunger for you. We've talked about revival. We pray your spirit would come down yeah. on their churches, on their communities, Lord, yeah. and you do an amazing thing. We yeah. pray for wildfires just to break out. Yeah. I pray, Lord, that they would return to their first love. I pray you'd baptize them afresh in your spirit. Pray that your word would come alive to them. I pray you'd give them joy in serving you. And I pray you'd give them friends to walk in and journey in ministry. Lord. And so we bless you, Lord. We honor you. And Lord, your word says, no eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind can see what God has prepared for those who love him. But You've revealed it by your spirit. Well, Lord, reveal it some more, please. Reveal it and encourage your church leaders.
Hey, before you go, we want to let you know about a few things we do here at CCLN that might serve you as you lead yourself and others. First, we have a podcast. The Canadian Church Leaders Podcast features brand new episodes every two weeks, featuring conversations with church leader voices from across Canada and the world. We also send out a newsletter to our network every month that contains helpful resources and content that our team curates for pastoral ministry in the Canadian context. And if you're a senior pastor, or you're on the trajectory towards senior leadership in the Canadian church, we run a two-year program called the Church Leaders Incubator, created for young pastors to strengthen their character and ministry for long-term effective senior leadership. You can find everything that you need at ccln.ca. There, you'll find ways to listen to our podcast, sign up for our newsletter, or learn more about the incubator. Lastly, if you or your church wants to partner with CCLN in our mission to lift up and serve pastors across Canada, we invite you to consider making a one-time or regular donation. You can do that or find out more at ccln.ca slash partner. Thank you so much for watching this video. From myself and the CCLN team, we love you and we are cheering you on.